There we go. All right. Okay. All right, let's get started. Lecture six. Um, and uh, somebody pointed out on the um, uh, on the schedule that I have a slight typo in my uh, in my in my schedule because I had always planned on doing four reactions lectures, and um, uh, it the the tentative schedule only lists three. My apologies for that. Um, but uh, I had basically rearranged the class a bit to uh, collect the the trusses and the truss deflections and the beams and beam and frame deflections at the same time. And uh, I guess I missed a, a reactions lecture. But uh, what I will not do is change the exam date um, or the, the topics that are going to be covered on the exam. That I mean, it's all going to be uh, the same. What will probably end up happening is we'll probably finish the trust stuff a day early um, and we'll probably be right on time uh, by the, uh, the exam. So my apologies for that. Um, attendance grades are up to date. Uh, homework 2.2 has been graded. The solution was posted. That one was uh, uh, an interesting homework to grade. I mean, by and large, everybody did well. I think that um, if there were any mistakes, it was little stuff. Um, there were a couple of you that got tripped up on the, um, the ratios, the, the trig functions and whatnot. Um, but not most of you. Uh, I think everybody, by and large, did pretty well on that. Uh, I've posted the solution, so between the solution and the comments that are posted, uh, I think you'll you'll be able to navigate what's going on there. Homework 2.3 is due today, and I had a question about this in statics, and so I wanted to clarify that because I'm going to do the same thing in here. I am going to assign a homework today that's due Wednesday, not Monday. Okay, it's the holiday, so you don't have any homework due Monday. All right, so. Everybody good on that? Okay. All right. So today is the last reactions lecture, uh, and then we will get into our first system level analysis topic of the semester, which will be trusses. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to analyze trusses, and uh, you, before, and this is what I was mentioning a second ago, um, you know, traditionally when I've taught structural analysis, I would teach you how to solve the truss. Uh, and then later in the semester, teach you how to compute the deflections. And what I'm going to try this semester is to do it all at the same time. Um, because th they do sort of naturally go together in terms of uh, how you do that. Um, there is going to be uh, a somewhat theory-heavy lecture uh, in one of those uh, uh, slots in one of those days. And for that theory-heavy lecture, I'm not going to give you a homework assignment. So you, that, you'll get a break uh, that day. But let's, uh, let's get into the topic of today, uh, which is our final lecture on reactions. And specifically, what we're focusing on are internal hinges today. So let's just make sure uh, we recap what we've done so far. And to be clear, we've done a lot. Um, we can handle concentrated loads. We can handle distributed loads. And by distributed loads, I mean uniformly distributed loads and triangular loads uh, as well. Um, we can handle loads that are at an incline. Um, so I think somebody asked, are distributed loads ever at an incline? No, and I'm not going to ask you to handle that uh, on any homework or exam. But we do have situations where the member is on an incline, like on a roof, and the snow load is up and down. So it kind of looks like if you were to put the member flat, the distributed load looks at, like an incline. I'm not going to worry about that for an exam, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, we've also been able to handle concentrated moments. Um, and then uh, uh, to that effect, in terms of the boundary conditions, we've handled all the boundary conditions that uh, we really need to deal with for the most part as civil engineers, pinned, rollers, uh, and fixed supports. Um, there is, I guess, a, a fourth boundary condition, which really only shows up in some more like advanced analysis topics, as if you had like an elastic support. We're not going to worry about that in, in here. And 99% and of all structural engineering designs, you never have to consider stuff like that. So we'll just uh, move on from there. But there is one um, tool or one component in, in our uh, modeling techniques that we have not dealt with yet, and that's an internal release. Uh, particularly, a, uh, an internal hinge is what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, just like with concentrated moments, I said that uh, what I want to do is ensure that I'm, I'm giving you a real-world example. Uh, I don't want to just 
throw something at you and say, here's this, you know, a uh, weird theoretical concept that you're never going to see in real life, uh, but we're going to do it in class. So I'm not, I don't want to do that. Um, so do internal releases show up in real life? Yes, they can. Um, I had mentioned uh, uh, a while back the concept of a pen and hanger connection uh, that transmits shear but not moment. Analytically, we would treat that as an internal release. Um, also, uh, maybe a more modern type of connection example, if we ever connected to a uh, uh, I-beams in this fashion, where we connected the webs, but not the flanges, um, we would idealize that uh, as an internal release. Because the flanges are what we consider to transmit moment, and the web is what we consider to transmit shear. That's a, somewhat of an oversimplification, but not that much. Um, and so analysts would, would treat that as a hinge. Now, one thing that's also worth mentioning about hinges which is similar to a concentrated moments, is that there are also instances where even if the hinge is not present on the structure, and even if it doesn't exist in real life, the um, mechanism that a hinge uh, employs is useful for some later analysis topics. So one um, example that I can think of is something we are going to do later, which is uh, constructing what are called influence lines. And I've mentioned influence lines before, but basically they are an analytical tool that we use to assess structures that are, are subjected to moving loads, like bridges. Uh, and in order to draw certain types of influence lines, we will actually put a hinge in the structure and look at how the structure deforms. And so understanding how hinges work is critical for some later analysis topics down the line. Again, even if there's no hinge present on the structure. Now, in terms of how I draw a hinge um, on a structure, I might use one of these two fashions. I might just put a little circle inside the beam, or I might put a big old dot on it or something like that. Um, more often than not, I might just say, there's a hinge right here to make sure that there's no uh, confusion. Because the last thing I want is for you to look at a structure and go, is that a hinge or it's not? I want it to be clear that, OK, there's a hinge here you need to consider. Okay. Uh, any questions, just understanding what a hinge is, basically, and we're going to talk about the statics and the internal forces and whatnot here in a second, but everybody good so far? Okay, now a while back I mentioned the secret weapon of structural engineering, which is a, a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan or, I don't know, maybe a chainsaw if you're an Evil Dead fan, I don't know. But um, uh, one of the most powerful tools that... Uh, an engineer possesses is the ability to cut a section, okay? Um, what we're doing when we're cutting a section is we're using the principles of statics to investigate the internal forces and the internal response of a structure at a given point. And it's incredibly valuable for a number of reasons. We can use it to validate uh, the answers of an analysis. We can determine internal shears and moments uh, in a given uh, uh, member, which to be clear, I mean, right now, all, what we're talking about is external support reactions. But if I'm a structural designer, if I'm designing this building, yeah, I need the external reactions because I need to know how much force is going to the foundation, right? Something has to hold this building up. But if I'm designing the beams and the columns and the connections and all that stuff in the building, I do need to understand the internal forces inside those elements in order to be able to size them. So cutting a section is an incredibly important concept. Okay? Uh, it's also used from an analysis perspective from the, for the, the math that we do. We use it to develop moment and shear functions. Now, I mentioned this a while back. I am not a symbols guy. I don't like throwing X at you unless I need to. But there are instances where we do need functions for moments and shear. Um, they're, they're, uh, it's it's uh, necessary for determining deflections using the method of virtual work. We'll talk about that later. Um, also, for some very common loading configurations and loading scenarios, the moment and shear functions are actually quite useful. Instead of shying away from them, as an analyst, you, you might ad really want to adopt them because they're going to make your life a, a lot easier. But we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. Now, what's the deal with cutting a section? I want you to try and conceptualize this in your head so that you understand why it's so important, okay? So let's say that I'm sitting on this table, okay? So I'm sitting right here, all right? And uh, let's pick somebody, Let, let's pick you, okay? And I give you a lightsaber and I say, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this bag right here. I'm gonna sit down on this table, okay? 
and she grabs this lightsaber and cuts through the table right here. What happens to me? Okay, what happens to her grade? I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But but let's let's think about that. Okay, this is why the, um, the 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 concept is so important. Okay, when you cut a section, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, if I cut this section, okay, if I cut a section right here, Dr. Mike's going to fall down. Okay, why is that? Okay, it's because right here at this particular point in the structure, there are internal forces inside here, right? And so the idea is that I can develop those, I can use principles of statics to determine those internal forces. Okay, so what happens when you cut a section? So here's the table, okay, she's got the lightsaber, bam, right through the table. Okay, so let's look at this, this uh, first schematic, okay? So if, and, and let's read the note that goes with it, because this is really, really important, okay? So if you cut a section through an arbitrary point in the structure, and, and, I'm, and when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about 2D, okay? I'm keeping it simple, okay? When you cut a section through an arbitrary point in a structure, you're going to get, at most, three unknown internal forces inside the structure. An unknown force in the X direction, an unknown force in the Y direction, and an unknown moment, right? Now, the reason why I've got different symbols on different sides is just the, the equal and opposite effect, right? So if I cut a section and I look at the left side, I'm going to get some forces. If I look at the right side, I'm going to get some forces. Those forces are just equal and opposite in magnitude, right? Think of the tug of war, right? If he's got a rope and I've got the other end of the rope and we're both applying 20 pounds of tension, we're both doing the same thing to the rope, He's just yanking that way, and I'm yanking this way, okay? So it's the same concept, just looking at it internally inside the structure, okay? And so the symbols that I'm using, you know, obviously M is for moment. Um, the letter V, I'm using the letter V because that's the letter we typically use to represent shear because um, it's a change of verticals. Uh, that and the letter S looks like the letter or the number five, and so that gets confusing for me. I think your book uses S, and I don't like that, so I will probably use V. Uh, and the letter P is typically used for axial force because, like, sigma equals P over A for axial stress. Okay. Um, so I'm going to break this down uh, here in a second to give you a little bit more detail. But the point is, is that if you cut a section through any arbitrary point in the structure, you're going to get three, at most, three unknowns. Now, the whole point of, of what we're talking about today is what happens if you cut a section through a hinge, okay? If you cut a section through a hinge, you can still get that axial force in the X direction, and you can get that shear, but you can't, there's no moment. There's no internal moment there, okay? The idea is, okay, here's a door, right? This door is being connected to the wall with this hinge, okay? So if I'm looking at the door right here, right, I can take the door and I can yank it this way, right? I can pull it along its axis, and I can do this, like I can yank it this way, but it freely rotates about the hinge. It cannot resist moments, okay? And that's why the door freely rotates, all right? It, I can yank it this way, and I can yank, yank it that way, and the door will resist, but not under that rotation. So when I cut a section through a hinge, that's what's going on. I've got an unknown X, uh, X force, an unknown Y force, but the moment is zero. So the, the beauty of it is I can cut a section at the hinge, draw the free body diagram, and I can sum moments at that hinge. And I know that the sum of moments equals zero, and I can use that to solve for my unknowns. Okay? And that's the whole point. Now, like I said, um, whenever you cut a section, uh, whenever you cut a section, you can get three unknown forces. To be honest, what you see on this slide really isn't going to mean a lot for today, uh, and that'll become clear in a bit. But as we progress throughout the semester, this sign convention is going to become very, very critical. Okay, And so let me explain what's going on. Whenever you cut a section uh, and look on either side, you're going to get equal and opposite responses. Okay, So let's talk about axial forces. Let's just look at some numbers. If I cut a section and I draw a free body diagram of the component to the left of the structure, some, I'll, I'll say that is looking to the left, like cut a section and look to the left. And if I do all my math 
and I get an axial force of, I don't know, 25 kips to the right, then when I look at this side and I draw my free body diagram, it's going to be 25 kips to the left. It's going to be equal and opposite. Okay. Well, what we have to do in order to ensure that we're uh, speaking apples to apples, if you will, is we have to adopt the sign convention. And, and honestly, this is just something that we've just accepted that this is how we're, we're going to uh, construct our, our diagrams and this is how we're going to uh, express positive results. So let me explain, for example, why we uh, draw this in this fashion. Let's look at the axial forces. So what I'm proposing for positive axial forces is that if I cut a section, positive axial forces on this side are pointing to the right and positive axial forces on this side are pointing to the left. Why do I have it drawn that way? Because the idea is that regardless of what side of the section that you're looking at, if I look at, I don't know, this side, let's, let's just focus on this. The axial force is pulling away from the member, okay? Now, why am I considering that positive? Because, let me ask you this, would that be a tensile force or a compressive force? Tensile, it's yanking on it. And if you yank on something, it tends to increase its length, right? So that's sort of the idea. The whole, the whole point I'm getting at is that when we do analysis in this course, more often than not, we will assume that tensile forces are positive. Okay, So that's what this sign convention is basically saying, that positive axial forces are going to be tensile axial forces. Okay, um, With shears, the reason that I have, the, uh, and the same thing with moments, the reason that we have the sign convention drawn in this fashion, uh, and it won't really mean a lot right now, but when we start constructing shear and moment diagrams, this sign convention is going to lead to a graphical technique to construct shear and moment diagrams that's really easy to conceptualize. If we drew them backwards, there wouldn't be anything like incorrect about it, but it wouldn't be as um, natural to draw the uh, diagrams we'll use later. So again, I want to I be clear, this isn't going to matter a lot for today. It will matter a whole lot later, so I figure Let's go ahead and just bring it up now. Okay? Everybody good so far? What is going to matter is this. Okay? This is a problem that uh, is going to take us the rest of class today. Okay? Now, I want to be clear. Um, if you can do this problem, you can definitely do the homework because the homework is much easier. Okay? Um, this is going to be... Uh, as challenging as it gets, I think, in here, okay? Um, what we're going to find with this problem is the, the first thing I'm going to do with this problem is I'm going to attack this problem the way I've been attacking all the other problems. I'm not going to do it any differently. But we're going to see real quick that there's sort of a, a wall that we're going to hit. And we're not going to be able to progress any further. We're just going to be sitting there going, we don't have any answers. And that's where cutting a section is going to come into play. And we're going to make some decisions. We're going to draw some additional free body diagrams. And we're going to find that this is pretty straightforward. Now, how many unknown horizontal reactions are there? Horizontal. One. How many unknown vertical reactions are there? Three. Now that's a little different, right? Up until now, we've had like two or maybe even one if we did a, a fixed beam. But now we got three. Uh, damn. What do we do there? Okay. Particularly, what do we do with our assumptions? Okay. You're going to start to get to a point where you've got so many reactions that it's going to be difficult to conceptualize which ones are upward and which ones are downward. And so what I recommend when you're first starting out with these problems, just assume they're all going up. Let the math sort it out. If you get a negative answer, it's going to go downward. But just let the math sort it out. And I'll go ahead and tell you on your homework assignment, assume that they're all upwards. You are going to get one of them that's downwards. Okay. So, And I'll, I'll sort of show you why that happens uh, here in a bit. All right, let me pull up the notebook because I've got this here. I don't want the annotations. So, 
so yeah, and, and I also kind of like this problem because I think that other than maybe concentrated moments and whatnot, this has like everything we've been talking about up until now. We got triangular loads, we got point loads, we got all sorts of stuff going on here. Okay, so let's start off with those reactions. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way here. So, again, assume that they're all upwards. Just trust me on that. Okay. For this horizontal reaction, let's assume it acts this way. But what is that reaction? Zero, zero. zero right? So I'm going to go ahead and just put that off to the side right now. I'm going to say note sum of forces in the x direction is zero. Ax is zero. In fact, what I might do is I might just put Ax equals zero right there. Just to say that I have considered it, I did the analysis, it's zero, move on. Okay? Okay. Now, let's see if everybody's been paying attention for the past couple of homeworks because this is going to round it out. Okay? So, let's start collapsing these distributed loads into point loads. Let's start off with this one. What is the magnitude of the point load going to be? 30. And then, I, what, so I heard somebody say it. Seven and a half feet from that left support. Exactly right. Exactly correct. Okay. Move this over here. Now, um, what about this triangular load? What is the magnitude of that triangular load going to be? 30, right? 15 times 4 is 60. 60 divided by 2 is 30. Okay, it's exactly correct. Oh. Sorry, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is 30 kips. And so that we're all clear, what is that dimension? 5 feet. And finally, what is the deal with this load right here? Collapsing that into a single point load yields a magnitude of what? 18 kips. And so this is 7.5 feet, 7.5 feet. In fact, while we're at it, let's just fill in the others. 7.5 feet, and then this dimension here is 10 feet. Is this a, a fair assessment? Everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to utilize the tools that I've been, you know, dealing with this whole time. Okay, give me a second. Where'd my little mouse pointer go? Let me drag this down a bit. Okay, I want to utilize the tools that I've been, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploiting this whole time, and I want to start. Okay, we've got our three equations of equilibrium, right? So let, let's let's think about this. Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, sum of moments. We've already used sum of forces in the x direction, right? So that was good. Sum of moments, okay? Now, we strategically sum moments to try and eliminate as many unknown reactions as possible. So I still think it is a good idea to sum moments at A, right? If I sum moments at A, it gives me, you know, I can start at the left and work my way over, and I eliminate these two, even though I already know that one's zero. Um, so let's sum moments at A, okay? Okay, let's see. So, do we have to consider AY? 
No. Do we have to consider uh, AX? Well, we, no, it's zero, but still no. The 30 kits, left or right? Moment arm, 7.5 feet, exactly right. What's the next load? If I start at the left, work my way over. I did the 30 kips, what's next? Don't forget the 14, yeah, so 14 times what moment arm? 15, so 14 kips times 15 feet. Okay, all right. Next one is BY, right? Left or right? Times the moment arm of? 30, BY times 30. Next load, 30 kips. What's the moment arm from A? 35, right? We're here. We're always summing moments here. 15, 35. Okay. What's the next load? 18. 18 times a moment arm of what? Say it again. 52 and a half. I think that sounds right. Yes. All right. Did I miss anything? CY. Oh, that's going to be interesting. CY times a moment arm of 60 feet. Interesting. Let's take it slow. Start out with all this hullabaloo here on the left. What is this? If I do that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that, what do we get? All right, so 24, 30 foot kips. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. So now that equals BY times 30 plus CY times 60. Uh, okay, so what's BY? I don't know. What's CY? Uh, we don't know, okay? Here's the thing. We don't know what BY is or CY is. All we know is that whatever BY is and whatever CY is, if I take BY times 30 and CY times 60, it's going to give me 2,430. So I, I haven't gotten an answer. I have some useful data, but I don't have an answer. It's not like this where I have AX equals zero. I just have this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a box around this. And I'm going to call this equation one. And just so we also have it for reference, I'm going to write it up here. So BY times 30 feet plus CY times 60 feet is 2430 foot kips. Again, it didn't give us an answer. We wanted BY equals something, CY equals something but it's useful data. So if I have used sum of forces in the x direction and I've used sum of forces in the y direction, or sorry, sum of moments, I just let it slip. What's the other one? Sum of forces in the y direction. Let's go ahead and do that too. Maybe we can get some additional wisdom out of that. So let's sum forces in the y direction. So what do we have going up? A, Y, B, Y, and C, Y. What about going down? Well, I've got 30, 14, 30, 18. And 
And that's it, because I don't have to consider this AX. So over here on the left, AY plus BY plus CY is what? What does that sum up to be? 92. No, 92. I didn't have myself. So does that get us any closer to solving for these reactions? I mean, it's a good data point, but we still don't have the answer. So, damn, now what, right? <laughs> I'm sure that, like, without today's lecture, given a problem like this, this is exactly how you'd probably feel at this point. Okay, so that's equation two, and let's write that up here. AY plus BY plus CY is 92 kips. Now, before we reveal the answer, and if you've been paying attention, you already know what the secret weapon we're going to use is, but I do want to be very clear on something. These two equations are predicated upon a, the following assumption, that these reactions are all acting upwards. This becomes an algebra problem. Just keep the reactions upward. If you get a negative answer, that means they're going downward. So just let the math work itself out. Don't try and uh, change your, your assumptions or anything. Just, just let it go. Okay, so what are we going to do in order to actually get some answers? We're going to recognize that this problem does not have three equations of equilibrium, it has four. We know that the sum of forces in the x direction are zero. We know that the sum of forces in the y direction are zero. We know that the sum of moments uh, externally about the structure is zero. The fourth equation is that the sum of internal moments right there are zero because that's a hinge. Remember, we have a hinge right here. That's a hinge. So, what are we going to do? We're going to break out the samurai sword or lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, and we're going to chop that structure in half right there. Now, let me be clear about something before we start doing this, okay? And, and this is the point I want to get across for any of the problems that we do in this course. If you, that beam doesn't care how you do the problem, okay? The reactions are what the reactions are, okay? whatever the answers may be. It doesn't care how you do it. That doesn't mean you can't be strategic and make your life a little easier, okay? Let me give you an example. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm gonna erase this little hinge symbol here. What we're going to do is we're gonna slice this structure in half right here. And I'm gonna call it section one one. You can call it whatever you want. I just kind of use that because whenever we engineers draw section views on drawings, we'll do like section 1-1 or section AA. doesn't matter. Now, whenever you cut a section, you split the structure up into two free body diagrams. All the hullabaloo on the left and all the hullabaloo on the right. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Which looks easier to deal with? Look into the left or look into the right? Right, there's less stuff there, okay? So let's cut a section and look to the right, okay? So what that means is I am going to imagine copying and pasting the image of the structure and completely erasing all of this. So we're just going to redraw the structure. So let me scroll down a bit. So we're going to say cutting a section at the hinge looking to the right because it's easier. Again, the structure doesn't care which way that you look. I could cut a section and look to the left, okay? But, and I'd get the right answer, it would just be a lot harder. There's another reason 
that that uh, looking to the right is the right choice. If I cut a section and look to the left, I have one, two unknowns. If I look to the right, I only have one unknown. So even if the loads are more complicated, the unknowns aren't. So definitely looking to the right makes sense. Now let's redraw the structure. Now let's see what we get. So actually, let me, let me scroll this down a little bit. There we go. So there's that. We can say that like that's the hinge that we cut through. And then what do we have? We have a load like this. And how much was that load? Does anybody remember? No, I, I'm going to talk about that here in a second because you said 18. I want to talk about that as a homework hint near the end because there, there's an important point to be made about that. But what I'll say for now is that whenever you're cutting a section, to develop good habits, draw the original structure. Don't draw these collapsed loads, okay? Because there are ways you can make serious mistakes doing that. It's not a mistake for this particular problem, and that'll become clear uh, here in a bit, but whenever you're cutting a section and redrawing the structure, redraw the original structure. Trust me, it, you will result in less errors if you do that. And that'll become clear why here in a bit. We have this support condition here, and we have CY upwards. And what is this dimension here? 15 feet. OK. Now, what I'm going to do here inside the hinge is I'm going to draw the unknown forces it's not really going to matter and it's going to become clear why here in a bit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw those unknown forces and I'm going to draw them according to positive sign convention. Okay. So when you cut a section and look to the right, the vertical force should be upward. And when you cut a section and look to the right, the horizontal force should be to the left. You're going to see why real quick this doesn't really matter all that much, but I want to put them there just so that you are aware that they do exist. Okay? Now, before we start doing our analysis, we are going to collapse this into a single point load. And what was the magnitude of that load again? And this is 7.5 feet. Now, why did we cut the section at the hinge? Because we know something about the hinge. What do we know about the hinge? There's no moment there. So what we're going to do is utilize our fourth equation of equilibrium. The sum of moments at the hinge is zero. And what I'll do is I'll put a little arrow here up top just to say, it's the sum of moments at the hinge, and I'm looking to the right equals zero. So what we'll do is do that and treat this like we would any other problem. So if I'm summing moments at the hinge, now here's the kicker. Do I have to consider fx? No. Do I have to consider fy? No. Remember how I said that I'm going to draw this fx and fy, but they aren't really going to matter? This is why. Because I'm summing moments at the hinge, and so whatever direction that you draw them, it doesn't matter because they're going through the hinge. So I don't have to consider fx, and I don't have to consider fy. The 18 kips, do I need to consider that? Yes. Okay. So the 18 kips times 7.5 on this side. And then what do we have? CY times 15 feet on this side. Now this is more like it, right? 
Because now we're going to be able to solve for CY directly, right? What is CY going to equal? Right, we're going to have 18 times 7.5, which is what? 135. And what are we going to get? Positive, wait, now hold on. Positive 9, right? Boom. Let's write that up here. And I'm going to write it like this. CY is positive 9 kips. That's an answer, right? CY is a number. So let's do this. Remember, this was equation 1. This was equation 2. Tell me what I need to do. There you go. We take CY. We plug it into equation 1 to get BY. Then we plug BY and CY into equation 2 to get AY, right? Make sense? So, back to our equation. All right, let me scroll down. That, that kind of sloppy. Bless you. So, BY times 30 feet plus CY times 60 feet is 2430 foot kips. And so, BY times 30 plus, and CY, what I'm going to do is put in positive 9. And so this is why I said just assume all your reactions are upward. If you get a downward reaction, just put in negative 9. Don't try and rethink the equation. Just you got negative. Put in a negative number and see what you get. So what do we have? So I think you all are adept enough at algebra that you can solve this. What do you got for BY? 63. 63. And I heard enough people that I can consider that seconded. Positive, right? What about equation 2? AY plus BY plus CY is 92 kips, right? And I heard somebody say 20. And I heard enough people concur that that's seconded. And so because we got positive numbers for all of our reactions, the reactions are all upward. So therefore, AY is, sorry, that's not all my reactions. There was one more. Don't forget AX. AX equals zero. AY is 20 kips upward. BY is 63 kips upward, and CY is 9 kips upward. And before we leave, I want to address the, the collapsing into a point load because there's a really important point about that, okay? But before we stop, are there any questions? What do you think? This isn't that bad, right? One thing you could do is before you write the equations of equilibrium like we did up here, you could start out with cutting the section, right? Because if you did the cutting the section first, You'd get CY first, then you could sum moments at A, and you'd have a number for this so you could solve for BY. Then you could do sum of forces in the Y direction. So I kind of wanted to do it this way because 
naturally, I think the first thing you would do is some moments and some forces, and you'd get to this point, and you'd go, Dag Nabbit, what do I do? You know? And so I wanted us to go through that exercise together. Okay. Uh, let me pull up something to address the comment that was made at the end, because that's a really good point. Now, this is a structure that I just made up. This is not your homework problem, but it's a reasonably good point to, to make. I have a beam that is 100 foot long, okay? I have four kips per foot applied to that beam. If I collapse that into a point load, what is that point load? This is something to pay attention to. So if I collapse this load into a single point load, what is this? Sorry. Uh, I'm, probably mark, mark, would you split it? I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. Yeah. I, basically, yes, but you're going you're gonna to see what I'm talking about here in a second. But let's just take the whole structure, right? If I was collapsing all of this into a single point load, what would it be? 400 kips, right? Yeah, so this would be 400 kips. And this dimension would be 10 feet, right? Now, what I was saying earlier is that when you samurai sword or lightsaber through a hinge and you redraw the structure, so here's the structure. Here's the load, right? Here's the roller. I know I'm drawing this very sloppily. And there's your section cut. Does that mean this is 400 kips? No, it's not because you cut the section through the load. That's what I mean when I'm saying just draw the original structure and redo that collapse. So if I collapsed this part into a load, what would it be? 180, right? Because it would be 4 times 45. So this load would be a new collapsed point load at a new location. This dimension here would be 22.5 feet, right? Does that make sense? Don't. It, it is very tempting sometimes to just use the same load. That is incorrect. The point to make is that when we collapse this into a point load, that is a technique that we are doing to make the math easier on us. But when you cut a section, you are now dealing with essentially a new structure, a new free body diagram. So you can't use the same load as before. And so that's what I was saying earlier. For that particular problem that we just did, because of the, the conditions of that problem, let me go back to that. Because of the conditions of that problem, we were not cutting a section like through the load, right? It was at the end of the load. When you cut a section and you look to the right, it's still 1.2 kips per foot, and it's still over 15 feet. So it was still 18 kips, and it was still 7.5 feet, so on and so forth. What I'm saying is that that's not always going to be the case. And we're going to have instances where we cut sections through triangular loads. And that's going to be, okay, now we got to roll up our sleeves and figure that out. Okay, And so don't get into the habit of just automatically putting that original load. Redo it. You'll, get, you'll, you'll result in less error. Any questions? Have a great three-day weekend. We'll see you all on Wednesday.